Greetings from Woods Chapel United Methodist Church, and thank you for taking the time to listen to this message. We invite you to worship with us. Our Sunday worship times are 8 a.m., 9.05 a.m., 10.10 a.m., and 11.15 a.m. We're located off Highway 291 between Woods Chapel Road and Lakewood Boulevard in Lee Summit, Missouri. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at 816-795-8848, extension 321. We hope you find this message meaningful and relevant in your daily life. The last few weeks we've been talking about Wesley's three rules for living. Um, rule one was, where were you all two weeks ago? Do, do no harm. Last week, do good. This week, stay in love with God. I got to tell you, this sounds like an awesome topic to me. Stay in love with God. Uh, those of you that have been around here a long time can probably count on one hand the times I have uh, used a passage from Revelation for the scripture reading. Today will be one. Let's stand for our scripture reading, Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. That's a lot. That's like a lot. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. King James says, left your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. When I think about staying in love with God, the first thing that comes to my mind is what a giant, puffy, and nebulous word love is. God says he is love. God is love. So that's pretty important. It's this great, awesome idea, love, but how do we get a hold of it? How do we help it grow legs? If Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, fine. What does that mean? How can I take that giant, puffy idea and turn it into something that I can understand in my everyday life? One author, Kathleen Moore, offered these ideas uh, to know or measure if you're in love with someone. Number one, you want to be near them physically. Number two, you want to know everything about them. Number three, you rejoice in their existence, in the fact of them. Number four, you fear their loss, you grieve their injuries. Number five, you want to protect them. Number six, you are transformed in their presence. Being around them makes you better, makes you full. Number seven, you want to be joined with them, lost in them. Number eight, you want the best for them, desperately. And then, of course, there's that whole 1 Corinthians 13 gig. And you all know it. I have, I have couples that come and they want to be married and they say, just don't read 1 Corinthians 13. You know, I'm going to keep telling you, once we get it right, we'll stop talking about it. But it could be the scripture every Sunday, couldn't it? It helps us put into practice this giant idea of what is love. If you 
have a relationship with someone else and you use the, love, the word love to mark that relationship, are these the characteristics of that? Patient, kind, does not boast, is not proud, love is not rude, love is not self-seeking. Does that mean that any relationship where I catch myself being self-seeking that maybe it's not completely about love. Love keeps no record of wrongs. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love is easy to lose, or at least sometimes it seems that way. Here are these folks in Revelation chapter 2, they have lost their first love. Now, this is not a good story for this church, I'll tell you. didn't take them very long. Here, Jesus uh, uh, suffered and died about 30 A.D., and Revelation was written to, to the people in about 80 or 90. So in a course of 50 or 60 years, this church that is supposed to take the world by storm and win the world for Jesus Christ, they have lost their first love. doesn't take very long sometimes. And what's interesting about these good religious folks, and I'm not even going to tell you that, that they, they aren't Christian folks. Look at all the stuff they were doing. Look at all the amazing, wonderful stuff they were doing, yet their relationship was marked by love of other things instead of by a love of God. The honeymoon doesn't always last very long. Well, to lose a love is more than to lose a feeling. Feelings come and feelings go. But when we lose a love, it's marked by things like our priorities change. We spend less time with that person that we used to say we loved. And unfortunately, that person becomes less relevant to us. And if you have relationships in your life that used to be relationships of love, but now they're not, see if they are not marked by uh, less time, uh, less, less relevant, less, less important. Um, how do you know if you're losing it? My kids tell me all the time, Dad, you're losing it. How, how do you know if you're, if you're losing love? Is there anybody here that's not been on an elevator before? Good. There are rules of decorum on an elevator. You get on, and you mind your own business. You don't speak to anyone. You know, uh, particularly, I am mindful. If a young lady comes on the elevator, I might be by myself singing a wing, a whoop, a wing, a whoop, a <laughs> But when that door opens and that lady comes on, whoo! <laughs> Why? Why? Because this is a very personal space. We're all sharing personal space. You don't ever want to do or say anything that would cause that person later in the day to say, oh, I, this creepy man was on the elevator with me. <laughs> He kept asking me things. So, so they get on, and you just, you just don't, you just don't. You know, it's the rules, it's the law, right? Now, let's say uh, you're on an elevator with a friend. And Dave, we're going up to the second floor. We're on the way to a meeting. We might, we might chat a little bit. Yeah, such and such about your day, such and such about the meeting, you know. Um, a few months ago, the staff visited the district office which is in the old Blue Ridge Tower on 40 Highway on the seventh floor. And, you know, people don't think when they come up to an elevator. Most people, when they come up to an elevator, think, I own this elevator. When the door opens, I'm going in. They don't think who's on there or if people want to get off. So the elevator door opens and the staff piles in and they're laughing and joking and, and crashing into the walls and stuff and there's one little old person here by the buttons they didn't see going. 
they didn't know the rules. They forgot the rules. You ever been on, a, on an elevator with your sweetheart, with your husband or wife, and said, hey, time for a kiss, baby. You ever stolen a kiss on an elevator? My wife goes, get, get away, get, stop, <laughs> stop. It's, it's elevator rules. Okay, so here's the deal. Imagine now that you are on an elevator with God. We're just going to measure right now. We're going to take your temperature of, of, of your love relationship with God right now. You get on that elevator, what is it like? Is there this kind of uncomfortable, I don't know what to say? Or is there this relationship that's been struck where we can visit? Maybe we've known each other long enough, there's a, a sense of passionate joy. And the door closes and you have this, I'm so glad to have this time to be alone with you. How do you stay in love with God? How do you stay in love with people at home? You know, um, for the last four years, my wife has traveled almost every week for four years. On Monday, she gets on a plane and goes somewhere. And on Thursday night, she comes home. We've had to think hard and work hard on what it means to have a loving relationship. And it's all about communication. It's about spending time together when you can. People say to me, we'd like to take you and your wife out to dinner. And I say, well, she's in Dallas four days. Next week she's in, where are you going to be next week? North Carolina. Where are you going the week after that? Dallas. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Something going on in Dallas that I need to know about. <laughs> oh my. That was totally a sin. That was totally not right for me to say that. You know what she wants to do on Thursday and Friday and Saturday nights? She wants to hang around with me. And you know, there are times in your life when you feel like God's in Dallas or San Francisco. No, he's not. No, I mean, I mean he is, but he's, he didn't leave where you were to go there. What I mean is we feel like he's not here. He must be somewhere else. We know better, but we've, you know what I'm talking about. There are times when you just feel like he's gone. We have to keep up the practices that make for good relationships. We have to spend time with one another. We have to communicate. We have to make sure that the connections stay strong. And I want to take a commercial break to speak to those of you who are married. Most people that come to my office to talk about their marriage have waited until it's too late. They're like the Chiefs. About two minutes left in the game, they go, hey, we're, we're going to lose this. Listen to me. And you know, you know if you have trouble at home, today is the day. Go home and say to that person, I love you. I want this to be better. Say to them, I am sorry. Say to them, you win. I give up. Say to them, I want our future to be better than what it's been like lately. You initiate the communication. Take the steps to make things better. If you don't do it, it's probably not going to happen. Staying in love with God is not measured by highs and lows. It's not measured by mountains or valleys. We know, we're old enough to know, that life has ups and downs. 
feelings come and go. You can't, you can't depend on, on things around you, on circumstances, to make you feel like you're in love with some person or with God. You can't come to church and blame the sermon for, for not being in love with God. I'm going to tell you something. If you're in love with God and you walk in this door and you get a below average sermon, it won't matter. You just get so excited to know God. Man, you were excited when you got up. Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the breath of life. Thank you for, I mean, you're thanking God for miracles on the way to church. You made the preacher better just by the attitude that you gave him. And if you come to church and the choir forgets the words and the musicians play in all the wrong keys all at the same time, it doesn't matter. Because if you're in love with God, there's something in the music that touches you. There's something that happens. Staying in love with God begins with you. It begins with you and the choices that you make about what your life is going to be like. So how do we do that? Uh, number one, pray. And I want you to listen to me. I'm not talking about how other people pray. I don't care how they pray. I'm talking about how you pray. Even if you only have little prayers that you struggle through three times a week, keep doing them. Keep it up. Just because you can't pray like a saint doesn't mean that your prayers aren't good prayers. Pray your prayers. And it's be honest with God. If you got one of those little brown books out of the bookstore and you're praying in the morning and the evening prayers, just keep doing that. Don't measure your life by what great people did or what somebody said to you about what it all should be like. Just start with where you're at. A relationship takes time to grow. And by practicing and spending the time together over the months and years, that relationship will become greater and, and stronger. Number two, find times of submission. And this is kind of about prayer. This is, um, th this is the prayer that remembers it's not about me, it's about God. It's, it's those moments where my mind remembers that he is the creator and I am the creation. It's the not my will, but thy will be done. You want to enter into a relationship with someone, be in submission to them. Today, Lord, I will go wherever you want me to go. Today, I will love every person you want me to love. I want my life to be about you. Submission, servanthood is a key component of the Christian faith. Number three, spend time in the scriptures. Oh my gosh, there's another giant burden of guilt that someone has thrown on our back. Uh, you know what? Don't worry about what other people say you ought to read. Don't, if they said you must read the Bible through front to back, forget that. Not everybody can do that. Wait for Leviticus like in about five years, okay, when you're ready for that. But find the places that will speak to you. And, and, and get around those people that can explain that to you and read the simple things that speak to your heart. Uh, some of my favorites, Genesis, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, almost any of the, the New Testament letters, not Revelation. The Bible is that book that leads us to that relationship with God. It's not a burden. It's not a big guilt thing someone put on us. Find, find the words of life that are good. I don't care if you read the Gospel of John for the rest of the year and that's all you read. Oh my goodness, you're going to be so full and so blessed. Find those parts that, that, that bless you. Number four, devotional reading. Max Licato one of my favorite authors is becoming Rob Bell. Bill Hybels. Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey, he's the financial peace guy. Yeah? Yeah? But look at what he does. He takes scriptural principles, spiritual principles, and applies them to daily life. Isn't that what the whole thing is about? If we're not making the connection to daily life, what's the point? 
It's not just about having spiritual thoughts or religious thoughts. It's about how to get those things into our living every single day. Number five, spend time with God's people. People that encourage you, people that love you, Christian friends. But also with the marginalized, with the hurting, with those who need a cup of cold water. Wesley claimed that spending time with the poor would transform our hearts. And you know it because I have told you this. People come to our church and sit for years like a bump on a log in a pew. Not you guys. I'm talking about the other people. (laughs) And I preach to them. And I look them right in the eye. And sometimes I call them by name. And they don't change. They stay the same. And I think, I'm wasting my time. They go on one doggone mission trip, and they come back transformed. Something has happened to them, and I can tell you over and over again, the number of people, especially big, tough men, who went in mission in the name of Jesus and came back radically transformed by reaching out in the name of Christ. They became his hands and feet. A couple of nights ago, some of these guys were hitting me up about going to Russia, And I've not been to Russia for years. They've not been for a few. But their hearts are so still filled with passion for the people that they were able to touch in the name of Jesus. Teresa of Avila wrote, We can't always tell for sure if we're in love with God, but we're real sure whether or not we are loving our neighbor. 1 John 4 said, If we don't love our brother whom we have seen, how can we love God whom we have not seen? And so it's just true. When we love God, we are loving those around us. And when we stop loving people around us, when we stop being empathetic and compassionate, especially to those needy in the world, it is a sure sign that our hearts have grown cold. Acts of kindness are the tangible sign of God's love in this world. And when we do these things, the world gets it. I talk to people all the time. How did you find this church? Occasionally they'll say, oh, the building was so pretty as I drive by the highway. I decided to try it. Sometimes they'll say, the daycare or um, upwards basketball or something. Two things I hear more than anything. Someone invited me, but there is a consistent theme. I heard what you were doing in the community. I heard what you were doing around the world. I wanted to be a part of a group of people that believed that God could do something. I wanted to be a part of something that was bigger than me. Number six, we stay in love with God by spending time with him in silence. Um, This is kind of different from prayer. Um, I want to talk about these times where you, you go to your quiet place, you go to your special place, and you don't even have anything on your mind, maybe. You just want to spend time with God. Uh, my friend Paul Dodds has a little place in Colorado where he camps, and, and it's just a place where God speaks to him. Um, The creator speaks to his creation through creation. Somehow through the things that are made, God speaks to our souls. That's why when you stand at a sunset, you go, whoa, it's amazing. That's why when you witness a birth, it's it's amazing. When you witness the wonderful things that God has done, somehow he speaks to us. He reveals himself to us. One of my favorite passages, Romans 1.20. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Don't wait to go to the Grand Canyon. Don't wait till the next time you go to the beach. Do you have a tree in your backyard? Is there not a bird that lights upon the limb that you can sit and watch and listen 
and hear the glory of God in the things that he's made. Go to Lake Jacomo. Wander down the path to where you're all alone. Go to Burr Oak Woods. Find those places where God speaks to your heart through creation. And we stay in love with God. That's what he wants. He wants to stay in love with us. And if it isn't going so well, it's usually because we got busy. We got other priorities. You know, we got TVs and we got cell phones and we got all that electronic stuff going on. We got video games and Lord knows TV on demand. Uh, when Jesus is, is in Jerusalem before his crucifixion, he looks out over the city and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you killed the prophets. You stoned the people that we sent to you. How often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. God is so willing to draw us together, so willing to be close to us. And you know, you know if you're in love with God or not. You know and only you know. This is not a sissy thing. This is not something that modern people should shy away from. This is about purpose and meaning and a hope. This is, a, this is about lives that matter in, in, in busy, frightening times. This is the hope and the opportunity of every Christian purpose, person, not simply to know about God, but to stay in love with him. So if you're here today and you have a sense of you're in love with God, that's awesome. I'm happy for you. But if you're here today and you're going, ah, man, I don't know that I'm exactly where I need to be, hey, go find that quiet place. Get on the elevator and strike up the conversation because God is willing and God is waiting and you will be glad that you did. Let's pray. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for the way that you change us, transform us, drawing us so gently away from idols and human foolishness, restoring our relationships with you and with one another. Bless those who will go home and talk about their marriage. Heal and strengthen them. Let today be a day of change in those homes and for every individual here that calls upon your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.